All right, so welcome back. This is going to be our second and final screencast for Chapter 1. Uh, if you recall, we've already gone over 1.1 and 1.2, and those basically um, introduce you to the idea of scientific method. And 1.3 is going to give us a look at some of the things that we could actually use to define whether or not something is considered alive. So the first thing we look at is a very basic definition of biology. And I think for most of us in here, we would be able to do this without ever even um, attending any biology class. So the definition for biology is going to be simply the study of life. But what we need to do is we need to look at, um, again, characteristics that are going to allow us to be able to define whether or not something that we're looking at is considered living. So no single characteristic is enough to describe a living thing. Um, some non-living um, things can share one or more traits with organisms. And so what that simply means is that um, you can't simply go out there and say something has cells. That's not going to be um, enough to decide whether or not something is alive. You need to look at more than one thing. And so in this particular screencast, we're going to look at eight individual characteristics that most of the scientific community has agreed can be used to determine whether or not something is um, living. So you're going to do an activity in class that's actually going to give you an opportunity to look at different objects and use these eight characteristics to decide if that object is alive. Now, one of the um, debates out there, and I, I threw this in the um, screencast just simply because it's kind of interesting that, um, you know, there's, there's people out there, because of what a virus is and what it can do, they would say it's alive. And this is a classic example of something out there that, you know, it kind of exists at the border between living and non-living things. And what that simply means is that they have some of the characteristics. In fact, they have most of the characteristics we would use, but there's still a couple that are kind of gray. You know, for example, um, a virus does not need any type of nutrition to be able to survive if you would classify it as living. And that's a really super important um, characteristic of life, the ability to take in nutrients and to be able to pull the energy out of those nutrients to power huge numbers of cell processes or processes within the body of the organism to keep it going. And a virus simply doesn't need to do that. So the virus is a good example, like I said, of something that kind of lies in between both living and non-living things. So the very first characteristic we look at is the idea that if you're looking at something alive, we are going to um, assume that it's going to be made up of one or more cells. And this is actually considered the smallest unit that is considered fully alive. In other words, it basically has all of the characteristics that we would use, all eight, um, to identify something as living. Cells can grow, they can respond to their surroundings, and they can reproduce. So those are kind of like the top three. Um, some people kind of, um, you know, you think about cells, you think about them being so incredibly small, and, and then that sort of leads us to think that they're pretty simple. But um, again, thinking back to your life science class, I'm sure you looked at, you know, the complexity of a eukaryotic cell. This cell down here has lots and lots of parts. Um, this is an example of a neuron. And if you were to take a microscope and look at everything that is on the inside, um, you would find that it's extremely complex. And you put all these cells together, um, they actually are also very highly organized. So they're organized inside, but they also associate with other types of cells on the outside, which um, basically helps to build whatever organism you happen to be looking at. So the second characteristic we would look at would be um, living things are based on a universal genetic code. And the one word in this phrase I really want you to pay attention to, and this is going to be important later on in the course, is that the genetic code is going to be universal. In other words, every single thing on this planet that has been identified as living is going to have this code. All organisms are going to store the complex information that they need to live, to grow, and to reproduce in this code. And there's a special molecule that we talk about when we talk about this genetic code, and it's called DNA. And down here towards the bottom, you can see a good example of that double helix nature of our DNA. That information is going to be copied, and it's going to be passed from parent to offspring, and is almost, as I said, identical in every single organism on this planet. So the next thing, um, the next, excuse me, the next characteristic that we're going to look at is that living things can grow and they can develop. And so what we want to think about here is what is really the difference between growing and developing? So when you think about um, growing, most of us would think about simply um, increasing in size. Maybe you get taller, maybe you get bigger, but when you think about development, 
you need to think about the word change, all right? In other words, what you looked like when you were a baby is probably very different than what you look like now. Um, during development, a single fertilized egg is going to divide again, again, and again. And what's going to happen as this egg divides again and again is these cells, these new cells, are going to differentiate. And to differentiate simply means they're going to look different from one another. And their job is to perform different functions within the organism. And so down here on the left, you're going to see a good example of what we would mean by development. Um, in this case, we're looking at a monarch butterfly. And if you notice right here, we have the egg. And I think most of us would note that um, in most cases for a moth, a butterfly, that there's going to be a stage before you actually see the adult that's going to be called a caterpillar. And that caterpillar is going to shed its exoskeleton and create something called a pupa. And that pupa is not really a cocoon, but it's a casing that that animal is going to use to eventually develop into a butterfly. And that's going to be the adult form. When you think about development for us, and these are considered the Carnegie stages of human development, obviously we start off at day one as a fertilized egg, and then as we continue to grow, as we continue to develop, again, both are being seen here, we're increasing in size and changing, there's a lot of change that occurs from that ball of cells that you see on days, I think it's 19 through 21, till when you get down here towards the end. So definitely looks very different between those two. You know, and a lot of changes occur from here to here. So the next um, characteristic that we look at is that living things are going to respond to their environment. And I really need you to be able to give me some examples of this in class. So what we use is something called a stimulus, which is going to sort of um, prompt the organism to respond to um, that type of situation or that type of change in the environment. Um, for example, there's going to be some birds that are going to resist eating monarch caterpillars. And again, we talked about the monarch on the previous slide. And it's simply because if an animal eats this particular type of caterpillar, um, they have a toxin in their, in their body that actually causes the um, animal to have a really bad taste if they try to consume it. And so what happens here is this is going to be um, a stimulus actually to other animals and even the ones that have tried to eat these caterpillars that when you see this pattern, don't touch it, right? because you know that they taste bad. Another example on the right that you see is the idea that um, if you've ever tried to pick up a, you know, a, a frying pan off the stove, and if it had a metal handle, um, you're probably never going to do that again because you let go of that really quickly because the heat is going to be carried not only in this part of the pan, but it's going to be carried through the handle as well. And um, that's sort of a learning mechanism. In other words, again, that was a stimulus and you responded to it. So your brain figured out not to do that again. Another um, characteristic we look at is um, that living things are going to reproduce, which means that they are going to produce new similar organisms. Um, most plants and animals are going to engage in one of two forms of reproduction. Um, it's either going to be sexual or it's going to be asexual. Um, if they engage in sexual reproduction, this simply means that the cells from two parents are going to unite to form the first cell of the new organism. And so, of course, we are sexual organisms. You know, you need a mom, you need a dad. Um, the sperm and the egg come together, and once that egg begins to grow, the cell, the egg, is going to start to divide. And again, we're going to get that whole differentiation thing starting to happen until eventually we produce what you see on the right. If it's an asexual type of reproduction, that's a little bit different. You do not need two parents. Um, you only need a single organism. And what they simply do is they simply either um, split in two, which is what some single-celled organisms do, or what they do is they do something called budding. And you can see this bud on this hydra over here on the right. And the important thing here is to understand that the offspring that are produced, whether it's, you know, simple cell division or budding, are identical to the parent itself. So there's no genetic variation occurring in animals or organisms that asexually reproduce. Here we can mix it up, but in this case we can't. And another characteristic that's really important to um, pay attention to is that living things will maintain a relatively stable internal environment. And um, even when there's external conditions out there that are going to change dramatically. So then what we have to th do is we have to think about, well, how is this able to occur? All living organisms are going to expend energy to keep conditions inside their cells within um, what we call certain limits. And there's a term that we use for this. It's called homeostasis. And over here on the right, sorry, this is kind of blocking the words here, you're going to see a, a diagram that is going to sort of illustrate that. 
you know, the big thing about our body is, you know, stability is key. And so if anything kind of throws off that stability, our body is going to work really hard to bring things back. So in this example, if you work out and your muscles get really um, exhausted, they get tired, what they're going to do is they're going to release CO2. And the problem with CO2 is it's toxic to our body. So this CO2 is going to um, basically be released into the blood. It's going to increase the content in the blood. And there's going to be receptors in certain vessels within our bodies that are going to stimulate the brain to say, you know what, the lungs need to increase respiration. In other words, you start to breathe really heavy. Because the hope here is that when you start to breathe really heavy, you're going to be able to release that CO2 into the environment and hopefully bring those levels down. Um, plus, you're also going to be able to bring in more oxygen to help to supplement what is being used as the muscles work out. And so in this case, your body is trying to maintain stability, maintain proper levels of CO2 and O2 um, within the blood. And so again, that's a result of this characteristic called homeostasis. Another characteristic that we look at is that living things are going to obtain and use materials and energy to grow, develop, and reproduce. And this is going to be a combination of chemical reactions through which an organism will build up or break down materials. And we use a special term for that called metabolism. I know this is a word that you've seen before. The picture you see on the right-hand side to me is perfect because what this simply means is that you need to take in nutrients to be able to grow and develop and reproduce. You just can't do that without, you know, basically you can't do that without food. You know, and the energy you're going to receive is going to come from that food. So there's going to be special processes within your cells, and we're going to talk about those later in the course, that are going to allow um, your body to be able to pull that energy out, and as I had said, use it to do various things within the body. But all of that together is called metabolism. And so the very last characteristic that we're going to look at is something called um, basically evolution. Um, it's evolution, which basically means to change. So over generations, groups of organisms are going to evolve or change over a period of time. And again, this period of time is going to be a long period of time. Um, evolutionary change is going to link all forms of life to a common origin. And they speculate that this common origin was about 3.5 billion years ago. And down here, what I've done is I've simply given you an example of how the horse has changed over millions of years. And so if you look over here, um, you can see that this particular representation of a horse is very different from what we see in the modern horse right now. And basically, we use fossils and different types of DNA evidence, etc., to help us determine how things are related, and, you know, where things have come from. Um, this probably isn't something you can directly see when you make observations of the object um, that I'm going to give to you in class or objects that I'm going to give to you, but it is something to consider when we talk about um, characterizing something as alive or not alive. All right, so that's going to finish up this screencast for 1.3. Um, you know, as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast notes before you come to class.